Hello everybody and welcome to Mind Clickets. My name is Lachlan and I am a sport and exercise scientist from Melbourne, Australia with a passion for esports performance, coaching and overall mental well-being. I've been into esports for quite some time, previously competing in COD4 Pro Mod and avidly rushing to 10 Prestige in MW2. I previously also coached StarCraft 2 and love queuing into ranked games on CSGO. I created MindClickers to provide an insight into the psychological and performance demands of elite level gaming. This includes getting an insight from athletes, coaches, management, and allied health professionals about their roles within the esports scene. In the following episode, I talk with Violetta Ivanova, a physiotherapist from Finland who is engaged within the esports physical health scene and also loves competing in hackathons. Violetta previously completed her thesis looking at carpal tunnel within esports, which we'll go into further in the episode. Violetta's insights should be acknowledged from all current and past gamers who have a passion for casual or competitive gameplay. Ensuring your physical health, whether that be ergonomics or exercise, is crucial, alongside ensuring set practice or playing time. My voice is a little bit croaky in the intro, but don't worry about it, the episode is crispy clean. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Season 2, Episode 3 of Mind Clickers, uh, where it's time to click both heads in 2020. Uh, I'm joined here today with uh, by Violetta Ivanova, who is a physiotherapist from Finland, uh, who recently did some research in the esports scene, looking at carpal tunnel and uh, kind of the injury scene in esports. Uh, how are you going today? Hi, thank you for having me. Pretty good, pretty good. Yeah, good to hear. Um, I'm glad that you, you know, we finally got the opportunity to uh, jump on the podcast. Obviously, we've been in discussion for for about a, for a little while. Um, but yeah, happy to have you on. Yeah, likewise, and uh, I'm I'm also glad that we figured out the time zones at last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, figuring out the time zones between Finland and Australia is uh, a little bit of a mischief, but uh, we managed to get it done. Yeah. Uh, so I guess we'll just start off with the background about yourself, um, you know, what you studied and uh, where your passions lie, uh, especially in the esports scene. Uh, I graduated as a physiotherapist from Santa Conte University of Applied Sciences. And uh, as you mentioned, my paper was on carpal tunnel syndrome symptoms in esports players. Uh, in my work, uh, I have had mostly neurological patients in rehabilitation. Uh, most recently, uh, I was in pediatrics with school age children, uh, mostly ADHD, ADD and autism, uh, also in rehabilitation. Fantastic. And uh, what, what is it that made you go down that line of work into, you know, pursuing the course of a physiotherapist? I think physiotherapy is one of those um, jack-of-all-trades kind of profession, or at least has the potential to be. Um, it is very physical, but uh, it also has a lot of um, a lot of opportunities around it. So um, that was kind of uh, my motivation, as well as uh, having experienced personally um, a lot of uh, very bad advice uh, coming from uh, from healthcare. Um, I've always had a love for technology as well, so um, I felt like there has to be a way to improve uh, methods that clearly aren't working anymore. So um, that was um, that was behind my decision to uh, just go for it and see how I can contribute um, with the uh, future treatment, especially in rehabilitation and injury prevention. Yeah, for sure. I love that. Um, definitely over here in Australia, physiotherapy is one of those biggest uh, domains that everyone's trying to get into. Um, and if you don't get into physio, it's kind of like a waterfall effect. So essentially, the people who try and get into physio, if they don't get that, they go into exercise physiology. Uh, if they don't get into that, they might go into OT or, you know, it's kind of like a waterfall effect. So it's a pretty competitive uh, area over here. How is it over there in Finland? Is it the same kind of thing? Uh, we actually have a good amount of Australian uh, students in physiotherapy over here. Um, because, <laughs> so that's where they've um, gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it is a lot easier, um, I would say, for them maybe to get in here because um, 
it is a very large country with very small population. Um, and physiotherapy has a very long standing tradition in the Nordic countries. Um, and it goes around the um, health promotion and um, that kind of holistic approach uh, rather than from a medical perspective. So it is a very lucrative uh, place to study. Um, it's a uh, very high quality education as well as uh, most of the Nordic countries have. And I, I could totally see why Australians would like to uh, to try their um, their luck in here, uh, despite the complete difference between uh, being always warm in Australia and uh, now we're having barely six hours of somewhat daylight outside. Um, as far as the program in here is, uh, we are one of the few that have um, English-based uh, physiotherapy. And I think for us here, it's a lot more difficult to get in uh, because they take very few people. Um, but otherwise, the, the education is so that... Um, Pretty much everyone interested in healthcare and well-being uh, can can find something for themselves in it. Yeah, for sure. And um, I love that term you used you know, as physiotherapy is like the jack of all trades. So you have a role in obviously helping on the physical side of things. Uh, you have a role in helping in the rehab kind of things. And you're really engaging all those different kind of topics and um, ultimately with the ultimate goal to uh, improve uh, people's quality of life. And, uh, you know, with the aim to return them back to work or sport or uh, even just improving, you know, being able to have a healthy lifestyle. Yeah, absolutely. And this is uh, still in the more traditional sense of physiotherapy where you work with clients. Um, but you can also work in uh, construction companies when uh, discussing accessibility. Uh, you can work for a furniture company that assesses ergonomics or uh, do assessments at workplaces uh, on ergonomics if a new factory is being created. Um, you can be involved in sleep. Uh, you can be involved in education and just a lot of different uh, options in technology, uh, prosthetics, uh, different walking robots, exoskeletons, and so on, uh, or on on the more fun side, you can also be involved in making uh, video games that mm -hmm. uh, revolve around uh, rehabilitation. And that is one of the up and coming uh, areas which I would personally like to get more involved. And I think it's, um, it, it is the, uh, the approach of the future of how we, um, how we prescribe exercise to clients that they actually do. Yeah, for sure. To be honest, if you if you put all those topics into a giant pot and pick one out, it sounds like all of them will be interesting uh, enough to engage in. To be honest, it really does sound like uh, the uh, everything's really in the mix there. Um, so recently, you published a, a research paper, and you know you started to look into carpal tunnel syndrome symptoms in esports players. Um, so, how did the idea of everything around that come around? Um. The idea started initially with uh, us having um, a heart rate monitor as part of our just general measurements and training uh, courses and university. So um, the first beat monitor that I had on, uh, we had to wear for about a week and record what we do uh, during that time. So um, I was playing some games on my own, and once I saw the report, it showed that uh, basically the report said that this is the type of cardio activity that you should be doing. And it was equal to a very light jog that I did uh, the next day. So it got me wondering, okay, what other physical aspects are there uh, when it comes to gaming that we don't really know of because there is not really much research. Now there's thankfully a lot more coming in, but mm -hmm. uh, at the time we're talking three years ago or so, uh, mm -hmm. there wasn't really much. So uh, I started looking into what would be possible to write a thesis on, uh, what would be feasible as it is just a bachelor's thesis and I'm the only person doing it. So it had to be as narrow as possible topic. And mm -hmm. 
uh, as my interest in neurology grew, I thought, okay, let's let's try with the carpal tunnel syndrome. And the main idea behind my thesis is to see whether um, playing for longer or ideally playing more video games, does that equal to uh, more symptoms or is the problem really somewhere else? Because um, everybody, everybody really likes to say... Um, oh yeah, if you play a lot of video games, that's going to ruin your wrist or something like that. But it's not based on anything. It's just guessing. Um, everyone who says that, um, or in comparison to gaming office work, because you use the same computer and mouse, right? Um, they they claim that, yeah, it's a, it's a high-risk profession for, uh, in this case, carpal tunnel syndrome, but once you go through the research, it's actually a very low risk profession. So I wanted to know what is the case. Um, so um, I signed with a team. Uh, it's Tikka Esports in Finland. It's a very small team, uh, but it's local to me. So they agreed to um, record a symptom diary for a week. Okay. Uh, which check through symptoms in both mouse and keyboard hands. Uh, I wanted to know if they have the um, uh, typical carpal tunnel syndrome symptoms, uh, which would be burning, numbness, pain. Uh, do they transfer to the elbow? Do they transfer to the shoulder or somewhere else? And then based on that, they were also recording uh a um, mouse movement measurement uh, with Mousetron software. So I wanted to know exactly how much they moved their uh, their mouse because such measurements didn't exist yet. Uh, so after everything was recorded for a week, I went over the results and basically did a correlation between the symptoms and how much travel distance they had with the mouse. Uh, what we found was that uh, there wasn't exactly a correlation for uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. However, uh, burning symptoms, which uh, appeared in only the mouse hand, uh, they were showing that uh, the longer travel distance you do with your mouse, the uh, higher risk for um getting those burning symptoms was and then that was also correlated with a performance drop uh, so for carpal tunnel syndrome you would need both hands to have the symptoms uh, in this case it was just the mouse hand so uh, just a simple uh, overuse of the wrist uh, and of course uh, my study is not industry relevant in any way uh, it was just eight people sample um, mm -hmm. However, uh, it opens the question, what we don't know yet about the gaming, what other physical stresses are involved in gaming, and who is at potentially high risk? Because if um, moving your mouse hand a lot uh, means that uh, you, your symptoms may increase, uh, then is that a higher risk for FPS players that have lower mouse sensitivity? Or mm -hmm. is there something else involving in it? Um, so that was just to open the conversation um, about um, health of uh, esports players, of um, potential injury prevention programs that can be put in place, uh, because so far there isn't any of it. Yeah, for sure. Some wow, some really fantastic things to really pull apart from that. Um, yeah, so essentially awesome th uh, thesis, you know, at, at the get-go. Um, I really admire you, you know, you stepped up and you you found like a kind of like a niche essentially um, within the esports area. And uh, I think when it comes to performance tracking in traditional esports, in traditional sports, um, you know, a lot of people uh, engage in performance tracking, whether it be in, uh, you know, basketball or uh, rugby or soccer. Um, there's a lot of performance around that. However, when you compare esports to traditional sports, there's not a lot going on. And, um, you know, looking at ergonomics, for example, in your situation, uh, I think it's awesome because, you know, we can even take into consideration back, for example, um, I know a lot of esports athletes tend to hunch over a little bit. Um, is there some correlation between, you know, back injuries and, uh, you know, performance and uh, potential for, you know, having at lands all ergonomic seats, for example. Um, 
and you know, as you said, um, even just uh, wrist injuries and you know finger injuries, uh, I actually can uh, kind of resonate with that because I interned at a physiotherapy clinic for I think about four and a half months, and a lot of the cases were uh, just usual work officer work officer um, individuals coming in, uh, you know, complaining of wrist actions, and it was because of you know their ergonomics wasn't set up properly. Um, you know, they were having, you know, kind of, uh, wrist symptoms and they were experiencing fatigue and soreness and numbness over time throughout the day. Um, and I think that, you know, when you look to esports, a lot isn't actually being focused on for the players, uh, physical health. Um, I think in recent times, we're starting to look a bit more towards mental health. Uh, we're starting to bring in the psychologists. We're starting to bring in the counselors to really get an understanding of how the players are feeling mentally. Um, but definitely physically, there needs to be that consideration put in place, uh, to ensure that the athletes have longevity um, because ultimately, you know, a lot of esports careers don't last long. Um, and uh, with having these higher risks, uh, it just shortens the lifespan uh, as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think ergonomics is a good point. I think it is very important to have uh, a very well set up uh essentially workstation. If you will be spending the next eight hours at your computer, then it is your workstation and it should be set up correctly and uh, having comfortable furniture that is designed for for you and for the way that you will be using it. Um, I think it's, it's a good uh, first step. However, it is not enough. Um, only, only having good ergonomics will get you as far. Uh, the problem will still come uh, from just too much doing too much, playing too much, uh, not taking breaks. And um, the way that overuse injuries happen is when uh, when you basically don't take breaks, you, you overdo uh, what you're doing and it, it leads to continuous um, agitation in the tissue and there's no, unfortunately, ergonomics that will save you from that. Um, it's it is very important for um, for players, for coaches to learn that uh, there are risks and you can prevent them uh, by taking breaks, by having appropriate structure for uh, the daily the daily grind. Essentially, how uh, at workplace you would know when you have your breaks. Uh, when you can have a stretch, when um, you can have uh, a little bit of food on the side or or a drink and then go back to what you're doing um, because continuously grinding for eight hours a day is not sustainable. It doesn't lead to better performance. Uh, in fact, your performance will decline uh, over time because uh, you will get tired regardless. And um, the more tired you are, uh, the more of the negative um, uh, results you will get. Yeah, for sure. Great points there, especially, you know, um, I think a lot of people go into it, especially those really starting to get into esports. Um, and they think that in order to really get better and to really get noticed, get noticed by a team, um, you know, maybe if they're streaming on Twitch, um, that they really need to have an emphasis on the grind. And um, they really think that longer gaming sessions will ultimately lead to ultimately better performance. Um, and I think it's that, that mentality they get trapped in because I think if you have structured maybe like three hour set uh, sessions, um, you can really start to hone in and understand, okay, these are the three hours I'm really going to try and perform my best. Um, and, you know, obviously after those three hours or, you know, four or five or whenever we set the boundaries, um, that's where we can start to evaluate, well, how did that go? Was those three hours enough? Um, how well did we perform those three hours? And I guess that's a good uh, a question for future research. Who's going to set these boundaries and how are we going to establish these effective boundaries for performance? Um, is it going to be the coaches that are going to be, you know, saying, okay, we're only going to be training for this long. Um, is it going to be external support staff uh, like yourself, physiotherapists, um, sports psychologists who are going to set these boundaries and say, well, you know, it, research has shown, um, you know, effective performance is only between two to three hours, uh, full focused, you know, maybe that's one or two scrims and, Another thing, there's two sides to that. You know, are the players going to accept that? Are they going to say, well, yeah, I understand that and, um, you know, comply with that essentially? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the more research we get on it, um, 
the, the more understanding we will have of what are the actual effects, how long do your um, attention span, uh, your performance and, and everything else that goes with it, uh, how long sessions are the optimal for performance, how long is the, the safest uh, uh, span of time that uh, we can actually really push for um, for uh, getting some results and of course what um, what time frame is the safest for the players uh, at what point do uh, symptoms appear and at what point we have to um, really uh, set the break times and uh, address what what not uh, comes um, comes with it whether it's mental fatigue uh, physical pain or some other issues that need to be addressed. I think, uh, as you said, three hours window is a really good time. Uh, whether or not that's uh, that's uh, enough, we'll know hopefully soon if somebody does uh, research on it. Um, but there really needs to be a structure in the day uh, because um, eight hours or some even would go for 10 hours um, every day. It's not sustainable. It gets you um, it gets you places, all right, but it's not sustainable after that. So we're seeing um, a very high uh, roster turnover. We're seeing a lot of burnouts within about a year at high level, which um, is unacceptable in, in, in any way. Um, mm -hmm especially since a lot of the players are very young. Uh, we're talking 15, 16 year old players uh, who compete at a pro level. And after about a year, they're out because they got a burnout. So um, from a clinical point of view, as someone who has worked in pediatrics, uh, that that is scary and really needs to be addressed because um, this is still a very young person we're talking about. And uh, we need coaches that are uh, familiar and educated in um, appropriate child development care uh, if they want to take even younger players to develop them. Uh, I think a good uh, comparison with traditional sports structure here would be uh, football or European football. Um, it is one of the best structured, um, organized physical activities that are team-based. Uh, we have a very good junior setup where kids will get uh, very good quality physical training on on football, but they would also get very high quality education at the same time, not at the expense of one another. Uh, then we go to the uh, to the semi pros or the young adult leagues, where um, again we have professionals that that know how child development is going to happen. They know how growth spurs are going to happen and they can address problems that come with it uh, appropriately. And once the players are 18, then they go to the pro leagues and they perform to their highest uh, possible level. Um, it is uh, very well, uh, very well considered, uh, very well structured uh, system. So I think uh, the esports industry in general has a lot to learn when it comes to uh, what kind of people are involved um, in uh, in educating the players, in coaching them, in pushing them to uh, to high performance, and of course uh, how to best take care of the players to make sure that um, we have longevity in their careers, that they can perform uh, on the top level for as long as possible and in the safest way possible. Yeah, uh, I really agree with some of those topics, especially, you know, having that regulated scene. Um, I think one of the big disparities, especially here in OCE and maybe somewhere, you know, in NA and even in EU, um, the whole idea of having a regulated scene versus unregulated. Um, and, you know, in an unregulated scene, um, you know, there's obviously people grinding and grinding that, you know, aren't actually getting that external assistance and they aren't really, you know, being treated for positive quality of life um, in comparison to having a regulated program where everything's a lot more structured, like you said, um, you know, having people that are actually they're caring for you, having set routines, having everything that's really in line for performance uh, with that goal of longevity, like you said as well. Um, I think that's one of the things that really creates a stable program and an effective program 
And I think they're the key characteristics that will allow programs like that to flourish and also allow programs like that to continue to develop. Because, uh, you know, over here in Australia, we have some programs, you know, universities are starting to adopt uh, esports programs. Um, you know, even some esports stadiums are being built. And I think, you know, the idea of these stadiums and programs being constructed is that the idea it will be a really big, strong, regulated scene. Um, because when you look at traditional sports, you know, you have governing bodies. And one of the biggest questions is, you know, how's esports going to be governed? Um, you know, obviously there's those big top teams, the teams that really strive in performance. You know, you've got your, you know, obviously EU and NA teams who are really at the top of all games. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to have a look into the, you know, look into their background and see, well, how are they performing? Um, how does everything work in the back end of stuff? Um, and compare that to, you know, maybe a lower less organization. But um, I think the importance of having some sort of structured program is uh, is critical. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, we have the really big teams uh, going on. Uh, some countries have started to make uh, their own uh, esports associations, uh, like Korea would have the KESPA. And mm-hmm. in Finland, we have, uh, it's locally called Seoul, but it, it doesn't have anything to do with the Korean Seoul. Um, <laughs> and in also in both of these countries, it, the esports association is part of the Olympic Committee. So... Um, Comparing again to traditional sports, there are the big teams, but there is also a very large umbrella organization above them, which dictates um, what it means to be a pro. If you want to play on the pro league, then you need to have uh, these structures set in place. And they are the ones who will be uh, truly regulating what goes on in the sport because there will be um, the independent body uh, on top of everyone and I think esports really would need that there are the large teams but there is still missing an organization that is above everybody that will release all the regulations the uh, injury prevention programs and uh, that will provide uh, appropriate uh, academic education to um, to professionals uh, that has some kind of a standard because um like you said, a lot of universities are opening teams. Uh, they're opening uh, programs for esports, but uh, none of it is standardized. And uh, I think in order to uh, to be able to provide equal uh, care and equal coaching to everybody, no matter what country they're in, uh, we would definitely need this kind of uh, large organization at the top. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, as you said, um, you know, with university programs opening in, you know, especially, you know, days where open days, who are those guys are targeting? They're targeting those straight out of high school, um, you know, who have maybe played and, you know, at that young age, you know, 15, 16, 17, who outside of high school, pr- pretty much, you know, unless they're working, most of their time goes into gaming. Um, so, you know, having that, you know, university level where potentially something's regulated is super appetizing. And I think that's where, you know, universities can start to uh, really thrive on uh, building a really structured and regulated esports scene. And uh, it'll be really interesting to see what kind of takes different universities have um, and the different kind of regulations and structure that each have and whether that difference between countries. Um, and as you said, having an overbodying, uh, have, an over, have an overshadowing governing body to ensure that everything's regulated as well. You know, you look to traditional sports and, you know, we have WADA for performance, uh, you know, uh, supplements and uh, drug-related stuff. Um, is there going to be something that, you know, really helps to look at esports performance health and uh, really ensuring that each uh, athlete and team is uh, following the standards that should be met? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there was already some uh, questionable uh, substance abuse cases from Korea uh, right. uh, talk at least about uh, anti-doping and that kind of uh, regulation. Uh, that just shows how um, how young the esports industry is. Like something that we would have as a no-brainer in every other discipline. Uh, it's mm-hmm. not a thing in esports, and I think it's it's really needed, uh, especially when we're talking about younger players, because that is really where. Um, it matters the most. Um, and as you said, the uh, 
the educational institutions can can have a really good impact on showing how um, how things should be organized. I loved your previous episode about the school system in Australia and how developing those esports teams within the school system. Uh, I absolutely love that uh, uh, the, the saying that uh, kids will go home and play anyway. So mm-hmm. we might as well just keep them in the school, uh, in a social environment, uh, in a in a team environment. Put a teacher. There's always a teacher that likes to play video games somewhere. Put a teacher there. They are uh, pedagogues. They are educated in pediatrics. They're um, they're educated in teaching. So put them there for the uh, coaching aspect. Make it social. Uh, I I love the idea of having a mini tournament at the end of the year to show all the parents, um, because I think uh, there is also a, a lot of a disconnect between parents and kids. Um, in my work, I have uh, quite often uh, been the mediator between uh, a parent that is um, very distraught that all their kid does is spend time playing uh, video games or being on their phone. And at the same time, when you ask, okay, what games does he play? uh, The parent has no idea. And the logic behind it is that, well, I don't play video games, so I don't really know what what he's doing. Um, But then when you put it into a perspective of, okay, does he have any other hobbies? Uh, Maybe hockey, maybe he likes to play football. And the parent says, yeah, yeah, twice a week, three times a week, we take him to practices and so on. And when you put it so that, okay, so your kid goes to hockey twice a week, you yourself don't play hockey, but you still take him and you follow through what he's doing. So how about we take that into games so the kid likes to play video games why not you just follow how he's working on it and support in that and if the kid wants to get better uh, you can get him coaching for it Uh, it is already uh, available a lot of gamers uh, pro gamers pro teams would offer coaching Um, so we're talking about the exact same thing you don't have to play yourself to be able to support your child in uh, in whatever endeavors they want to do, whether it's music lessons, uh, playing a sport, or uh, simply gaming. Uh, there is a, a path towards mastery in all of these, and it might just be for fun, but something else could come out of it as well. Um, so it it is worth a try. And once you put it that way, the parents really understand it's like okay so it's actually not all bad of course we don't want kids playing five six hours a day uh on top of already schoolwork and and other hobbies uh, because we also want them to get good sleep um but it is um it is definitely helping the conversation between parents and and players because um through understanding and like having a really good conversation between them uh we can ensure that there is uh once again uh, appropriate development going on and uh also a little bit of the stigma will come off from uh esports and gaming in general um if a lot more parents understand if they're on board with it um and at the same time we have more research coming out um, I, I don't want to say that it brings legitimacy to esports because it is already pretty legit uh, industry, but um, it it does bring some substance to back it up. Yeah, for sure. All really good points that, you know, ultimately when you step back and look, for the, look at them from an ex- external perspective, they all make reasonable sense, right? You know, as you said, um, you know, for myself personally, um, you know, I used to go to Taekwondo training and my, you know, my mum and dad used to take me there. Um, and, you know, it's the same thing with a lot of kids, you know, where they're going to different sports trainings, you know, are their parents actually getting involved and, you know, giving, sitting down and just saying, you know, hey, you obviously spend a lot of time gaming. It's obviously a passion of yours. It's a hobby that you like to, you know, participate in with your friends, um, you know, maybe show me a little bit more about it. And I think, you know, progressively we've seen that developing in recent years. Um, a lot more parents start to get on board and even game with their um, sons or daughters. Um, so I think it's something that's definitely starting to evolve. And, 
you know, when I think to, you know, different events, for example, um, I had the opportunity to go to the Melbourne Esports Open, uh, the MEO here in Melbourne. And um, one of the biggest events, you know, obviously, as you might know, it was a fortnight event. And, um, you know, a lot of parents came along just because the children were interested and the kids were, you know, keen to get on stage and, you know, see what it's like to be a pro gamer. And, and I think, you know, being a parent and going to that and, you know, understanding, you know, seeing their kids on stage, you know, it's really a different scene. And, you know, from a media perspective, um, as you said, there's a lot of stigma. And I think that once we start to flesh it out and, you know, really understand, you know, what esports is and where it can take uh, to the external media sense, um, there's definitely a lot of growth for it. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that, especially, you know, comparing traditional sports here in Australia as well, we have uni games. So in that sense, you know, we have traditional teams, you know, baseball, hockey, football, soccer, whatever, they all travel to, you know, a different state and they participate, you know, versing different universities. Um, and whether, you know, esports can get involved in that and, you know, make it, like you said, an end of year competition where there's different universities battling it out. Um, it's really something that's going to be interesting to see in the near future. Yeah, absolutely. And it um, the current esports uh, scene is very, I would say like 90% of it is really high end top uh, massive organizations that are involved. And we are missing that uh, amateur level. We're missing the semi-pro level. There are, of course, teams at uh, competing at that point, but it's not that well developed. And uh, I think through schools and through uh, college level, university level, uh, we can really fill in those parts and make sure that uh, people have the uh, the step up opportunity and if they really have a talent, then uh, they can uh, get appropriate education in, in the area and then follow through with the uh, pro teams after they're done uh, their um, ladder climbing, essentially. Yeah, for sure. And I think um, when we look to external media, for example, I think one of the biggest things that's hard for esports is that sometimes the dark overshadows the light. Um, for example, you know, if, you know, someone has to retire from esports at an early age due to injury, due to risk, when you look to recent years, um, there's definitely someone that comes to mind and that's Uzi. Um, and he, one of, someone part of the Chinese League of Legends team, and he had to actually retire at the age of 23 just because you know, he started to feel weak. Uh, he couldn't raise his arms. He couldn't sit down for long periods of time. He had degeneration and he also developed type 2 diabetes. Um, but in the retrospect, you see positive cases where kids are getting in, they're communicating, they're talking with friends, they're engaging, they're doing critical thinking, uh, they're engaging in pressure management. Um, and a lot of these things that, you know, the kids really have adapted to in, you know, it's skills that you learn that maybe you don't learn playing a traditional sport. And I think that it's a matter of getting the media on side that there is positives. There's a lot of positives that can come out of esports and it's not always the negatives. Yeah, absolutely. and. I think uh, esports needs to find that balance. Uh, people are different and uh, so are uh, health professionals and coaching professionals. Um, I think there is uh, definitely room for collaboration. Uh, we don't want to step on anyone's toes, obviously. Um, so uh, having that multi-professional team uh, within uh, an esports team can really uh, make the difference because um, every now and then there will be someone who is more prone to uh, developing conditions, who is um, at, at some point, maybe they have made the wrong choices uh, because there was nobody to tell them uh, what could be better and it just continued. Uh, so this is where um, healthcare professionals would step in um, in my personal view, uh, my uh, work will not be to sit behind someone back, uh, someone's back and say, uh, okay, now you take top, then you, you take bottom, then uh, you, can, you can take over the other guy and so on. Uh, that would not be my work. Uh, my work will be with a coach, making sure that if uh, there is someone presenting uh, symptoms for something that could be uh, a yellow flag, a red flag, whatever, uh, that 
there is uh, the conversation between healthcare and uh, the performance coaching going on. Because the same way that I'm not educated in performance coaching necessarily in esports team, performance coaches are not educated in healthcare and uh, rehabilitation. So um, having that conversation together, educating the players on what are the risks uh, factors, what are the, the symptoms that they need to be more mindful about. Uh, we mm -hmm. don't want to fearmonger anyone, obviously. We just want people to uh, to really learn to listen to themselves, to, um, to report. Uh, if something feels off somewhere, it could be nothing. It could be fixed with just uh, a longer rest. But um, it, it is very important for uh, for players to understand um, that you should be able to speak up about uh, any potential symptoms you may have and there should be a coach that can pick that up and then make the call to get in uh, whether it's consulting whether it's full-time uh, an appropriate healthcare practitioner that can alleviate uh, the problem and really give the uh, the proper prescription, whether it's exercise or something else. Um, and then together we can get the players back on track. It's all good. Uh, then they can go back to the uh, performance plan that they were following previously. Um, but that is all to, uh, to ensure that there are preventative measures being taken, which uh, in the um, primary prevention, that, that would be ideally that uh, the player never develops any kind of uh any kind of condition uh or that needs some kind of invasive treatment um if because in some cases it's really difficult to catch things very early um we want to make sure that players can go back to uh to that high performance uh whether they've had surgery or um needed some more time off uh, we, we need to uh, ensure that they have a continuous career afterwards and don't need to retire at so quickly. Um, a good example is, again, in traditional sports where you have longer contracts, you have about five-year contracts, and there is no pressure that you perform poorly one game mm -hmm. or you get a flu or something that prevents you from playing for a game or two. Um that's fine. You can get better and you can get back into the game and you can keep winning for that overall winning streak. Um, we don't necessarily have that in esports. The contracts are very short, which promotes that kind of uh, grinding behavior and overusing behavior and ignoring symptoms, um, which uh, it was also something that uh, the players that I worked with uh, reported that... Um, depending on what level they're playing, if it's just a practice session or if it's a competition, they might ignore symptoms or they might have really high level symptoms, but in the moment their performance is also really high because they can kind of switch it off. And um, it might lead to um, inappropriate or false reporting, which, uh, we also have in traditional sports and it's it's not great because uh we don't want to stop anyone from progressing we just want them to uh to be as healthy as possible while reaching that top um and it's it, yeah that needs rephrasing i don't want to step on anyone's toes and piss off some coaches here <laughs> you're right you're right and I completely understand everything that you're coming from because it's logically, it makes sense, right? Um, and I loved what you said about having like a traffic light system, having like, you know, maybe an amber or a red just so we can micromanage uh, individual cases. And, you know, if something comes up, hey, we can start to flag that. We can start to, you know, is this something we should really take a step forward? Uh, is this something that may become an issue later down the track? And, you know, I love what you said as well with traditional sports. Obviously, they have longer contracts. There's a lot less pressure to perform well. Um, and I think, you know, when you look to esports, it's kind of like restocking the shelves with a new product. You know, every, you know, couple of months you see that an esports team has, you know, rostered on two new people. They've let go a couple of more, maybe like a couple of months later, some more people have gone. Those original people have backed out. 
um, there's this constant uh, managing going in on esports because contracts are short. And because of that duration, it really places a stress emph- emphasis on the uh, the athletes to perform and, you know, really show that, hey, I, I am worthy of this role. I am worthy of, you know, being a part of the team. Um, and I want to, you know, try my best. And, you know, that goes back and links back into that grinding and, um, you know, going to potentially poor habits. And uh, it's kind of just like a big 360 circle of, you know, where we need to take a step back and really understand everything from an external perspective about, I guess, how we can develop a, you know, a system that really works in regards to performance. And obviously, um, you know, in recent times with G Science, obviously they're starting to develop some really good uh, some platforms over there um, with Optimum, Optimal, um, you know, and being able to, you know, develop a system that really allows coaches or performance coaches to, um, you know, get in and work with the athletes on a one-on-one and really understand how they're feeling. And uh, again, being able to pick apart and uh, micromanage different symptoms that they might be feeling uh, to ensure performance, especially leading up to big tournaments as well, because that's where obviously athletes start to have that stress they start to have that anxiety and uh, they start to fatigue as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think, uh, as you mentioned, uh, metrics and measurement systems are really important to be developed uh, specifically for esports because uh, only through that we can understand really what the stress is. And once we know the stress, we can affect on um, how do we get people better, what to watch out for and what would be the best approach for it. Um, but at the moment, there is there's a lot of talk of the consequences, but we don't know where does it come from. Uh, so it's kind of, at the same time, uh, research advancing, and then there's uh, the metric systems getting put in place with G-Science. And hopefully in the near future, we can kind of get to the same road, uh, which is very exciting uh, because... Mm-hmm. Uh, then we can start to discuss a lot more uh, with the players and coaches about implementing those systems. Yeah, for sure. And I think that it's really interesting to think that, you know, in future times, what sort of research and metrics are we going to start to measure? You know, I know in recent times, and obviously what you referred to earlier uh, in the episode when you talked about, you know, your heart rate um, and when you, you know, played some games, you know, was that spiking during intense situations you know, did it rise during, you know, if you're going for a clutch, for example, and we can start, you know, have some measurements towards heart rate. Um, we could also do breathing, you know. Uh, I definitely read that there was a couple of researchers that actually looked at breathing, uh, especially in a land situation um, where maybe it was a, you know, a best of three or even a best of one. And in those really tense and stressful moments, a lot of players tended to hold their breath. And, uh, you know, whether they performed well or not, you know, that was really impacting them. And, uh you know, it's really awesome to see that we can start to really dig deep and have, understand some metrics. Um, obviously, with eye tracking as well, um, starting to look and you know have a visualization or graph of where we are looking during different situations. And uh, obviously, that's really awesome from a research perspective because that just opens up a lot more wide opportunities uh, to do with eye care and eye health. Um, obviously, we've got like blue light glasses that are starting to make its way into its esports uh, scene. But um, I definitely think that you know the more metrics we can start to measure. Uh, just like traditional sports, it's just going to be better for uh, overall health. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, from my part, I'm happy that uh, there is a lot more focus on physical health uh, because so far it has been almost exclusively mental health and mental performance and stress management, mental coaching, uh, sports psychology, and so on. Uh, But it is also something that affects physiology and physical well-being and both of them need to be addressed together because improving the physical part will give you better cognitive performance as well and this we know already from research so it can be uh, readily applied to esports as it is a very um very cognitive uh cognitive work focused uh discipline and um I think a lot of coaches are starting to realize that Um, we have so far, there are very few teams uh, that enforce this kind of team wide uh, physical and mental training programs. Um, But um, I think a lot of teams are having single players here and there that might have their own trainer that might have their own nutritionist. Um, But 
I think in the near future, we really need to bring those uh, multidisciplinary professionals together and ensure that the entire team is uh, held up by those standards and that they're getting the um, the professional uh, growth that they, they have the potential to develop. And uh, it it's probably going to start from the top down, uh, like all the biggest organizations will get that first. And then everyone else will see, okay, clearly these are the benefits that we're seeing. So maybe we need to emulate some of that. And uh, again, it doesn't have to be a full-time member of the team. You can get consulting. Uh, you can get someone in for a little bit just to do a session or two and then see how that works. Uh, so uh, if there are any coaches or uh, players listening to this, please do consider uh, getting uh, at least a session or two with a nutritionist, with a physiotherapist, uh, someone that can really help uh, uh, ensure that uh, your physical well-being is uh, on par with your mental well-being because um, both of them work together. You can't, uh, unfortunately, you can't take your brain out of your head and only take care of that. You have to get the whole package yeah, I love that. It's just like, you know, you can't have, um, it's just completing the whole piece of the pie, really. Um, and I think that one of the biggest questions of mine is, how do we get these, you know, uh, athletes and players and coaches to become open to, you know, thinking, okay, maybe we should start to think about physical, you know, we've been doing a lot of mental stuff, we've been tracking, you know, stress, anxiety, we've been tracking mental performance, We've been seeing how well they've been performing cognitive fatigue during competitions in a best of three, best of five, you know, ongoing those big, long, heavy grinding sessions, but we haven't been doing that. So how do we start to engage with these players and these guys to really, you know, broaden their perspective and, you know, take some accountability for their physical health? Uh, I think a, a good portion of uh, the justification would come from research, which uh, there are a few papers in the works now. And I think that will also show uh, current healthcare professionals who may have no idea of esports and gaming as, as a thing. Uh, research will give them clues on what to, uh, what to pay attention on and how they can improve that. And the more of uh, these professionals we get then involved in esports, they can better educate coaches. Um, because like at this moment, if a player goes uh, due to some symptoms to their local healthcare center, I think no matter where they are in the world, the answer will be pretty similar. Uh, they will be told, well, just don't play that much video games then. Uh, but where this becomes a problem is what if this is your job? We don't tell office workers, don't sit at a computer so much. Uh, mm -hmm. No, exactly. of course we don't. Uh, we we take care of their symptoms, we rehabilitate them, and we get them back to working uh, the same way that they were working before. So uh, having that understanding uh, as well towards uh, esports players and uh, having the health promotion, uh, I think language would be the better uh, way to describe it uh, because you can't go with um, the typical health promotion that you would be going in a school, for example, with. Uh, it needs to have a very specific language uh, if you want to promote it to esports players. And I think through showing the performance benefits would be uh, a really good route because, uh, of course, players want results. Uh, they yeah. want to keep competing. They want to get the higher scores. So showing them uh, what else they can do to um, to help their performance, um, that would really, uh, really might uh, make them think twice about um, whether or not it's worth training or um, if they would rather just keep grinding the way that they've been grinding so far. Yeah, for sure. Just really starting to seek out that extra little edge that they need to maybe differentiate themselves between um, another member or another team. You know, obviously when it comes to trialing for a team, you know, you want to be able to have the extra edge of those extras trialing um, and being able to physically show that, you know, I can, you know, have that really good structure. I understand the benefits. I understand the performance side of everything. I think it's crucial. I think it's pivotal to, you know, longevity 
uh, and uh, all the points you've raised are just absolutely awesome. And uh, yeah, uh, one uh, other thing that I really want to bring up, um, as you man- as you talked about before, was just this whole idea of research, and um, you know maybe looking to a, a different idea or a different crowd for these research ideas. Um, one thing I had a chat with you a little while ago was this whole idea of hackathons and, uh, basically the idea that you hack an idea. So, you know, you have companies who come in and you know, whether it's healthcare, business, commerce, and they bring a problem they have and you participate in like a hackathon to essentially try and solve that problem. So can you explain to us a little bit more about how that works and, you know, what you've done in the past? Uh, yeah, hackathons are a really fun system, uh, for getting your brain working, uh, in not necessarily an area you're familiar with, but also in, in a completely different field. Uh, it's uh, based around really fast learning, um, mindstorming, and um, really getting a, a solution. And uh, it's the uh, basically the peak of problem-based learning, uh, which a lot of universities will have in their uh, curriculum as, um, as a way of teaching. Um, I highly encourage anyone who has uh, a hackathon near them, uh, just go for it and see how it works. Um, I think uh, in in Finland specifically, they are very common. Uh, every area has uh, at least one per year or two in some cases. Uh, they are often oriented around business and technologies, but... Um, as the latest one we had, uh, because in my city and my university are very uh, AI focused and a lot of technologies are developed, uh, we had also healthcare being involved. And uh, it's, it is very interesting to see what uh, companies are doing, what they're looking for developing. And on their part, it's really um, uh, it's really useful to see what uh, what students think along the lines of what you're envisioning. So uh, it's a great opportunity to network. Um, It's a great opportunity to win if you happen to win. Uh, But um, I think it's uh, in terms of seeing what's developed around you, uh, which you otherwise might not have access to to knowing. and we haven't had yet esports themed, but I, I'm expecting to see in the following years because a lot of universities are getting very involved. Um, so maybe from the business perspective, maybe from the marketing perspective around esports, um, possibly finding new revenue streams or hacking how how much uh, they can change the current constructs to uh, to optimize it. Um, the one I attended uh, most recently and won uh, was uh, related to using VR games in rehabilitation and how to make that very accessible to uh, as wider uh, array of uh, patients as possible uh, because um, patients might have uh, difficulties holding controllers, pressing buttons, uh, using fine motor skills, uh, so our goal was to kind of um, hack that uh, problem and make a solution that could work uh, for literally anyone, no matter um, what their uh, grip strength is, what their hand size is, and and so on. I think technology really has allowed us to do that. And gaming is a fantastic way to uh, include more people. It is very accessible. Uh, it is probably one of the most accessible disciplines out there. Um, and with companies offering uh, solutions for uh, a more um, accessibility mindful controller that has maybe bigger buttons, uh, maybe uh, some pedals. Um, I think the Xbox uh, had a really good, it was an entire suite of, uh, of products that are aimed at uh people who wouldn't otherwise be able to use a normal controller um i think gaming is uh, is a great way to bring some uh some social element to people uh, a lot of fun uh because um we are a bit stuck in the uh healthcare world that um you can't have fun that fun is bad because this is serious and this is rehabilitation and you have to follow the protocols and so on um 
but what we're saying is that people just don't follow it because um, it's not fun. And once you make uh, a rehabilitation process fun, uh, because let's face it, nobody wants to follow a piece of paper with a couple exercises for the next uh, two months, three months, half a year. Neurological patients might be in rehabilitation their whole life. So mm -hmm. you want to have a really, um, really good communication with the people and to not be afraid of having fun with it. Um, a lot of rehabilitation games are coming out that they use the exact same exercises that would otherwise be prescribed, that we know are effective, that we know work, that has been backed by science. Uh, just they're making them fun, which makes uh, people um, actually do them because that's a problem where physiotherapy can't really help if the person doesn't actually do what you tell them to do. We can have all the knowledge, but if you don't do your exercises, then it's it's all for nothing. So um, using those motivational mechanics that gaming has, um, the the fun elements and the social elements as well um, can really bring uh, people together. And it wouldn't necessarily matter where someone is. Um, it wouldn't um, it wouldn't be mandatory for someone to go to a healthcare center to get a procedure to get better especially now during covid times we can't always expect people to be going places uh for rehabilitation if they can also do something about it at home uh and not be put at risk because a lot of rehabilitation uh clients are in risk groups so it's um it's giving them it's giving them something nice to do at home that isn't boring and that is effective and it's making them feel better and have some some social support uh, from other peers that are also playing the same game. And if we can help with technology to uh, to make sure that even more people uh, have access to uh, playing, whether it's VR, whether it's console or PC games, um, it's uh, the more the better, basically. Yeah. Fantastic. I love that. I love the fact that there's, you know, as you mentioned, those motivational mechanics that allow us to, you know, have that accessibility to, you know, perform and to be engaged with, you know, those rehabilitation clients. Um, I think, you know, in recent years, it's definitely been an increase um, in the amount of, you know, accessibility that's come out in terms of gaming. Um, and as you said, you know, the uh, Xbox controllers start to become more adaptable. Um there's probably going to be some PlayStation fans who are a little bit salty about that. But um, it's definitely one of those things that I think is just absolutely incredible. And it just makes sense, you know, the fact that we have these rehabilitation clients that are coming in, um, they have the ability to engage with each other in VR. They have the ability to, as you said, um, do their do their exercises because, you know, more often than not, you, we might prescribe someone something, but, you know, how often are they going to follow it? What percentage... Um, do we get a return that they're actually following what exercises or routines are set for them? And the easier we make that for them to follow, I think the higher return that we're going to have on its effectiveness. And I think that you know, having something that's fun, having something that's sociable, having something that can engage with our interests a lot easier than something just as mundane as doing a couple of squats against a wall or doing some of those basic exercises, but incorporating into that VR realm and you know, even adding a little bit of competition to it um, it just makes everything so much more enjoyable. Yeah, so absolutely. there you can go. Uh, it's actually um, studied how much people will actually follow exercises. And the uh, the numbers were a bit shocking to probably a lot of healthcare professionals <laughs> who are very eager to give a very thorough, very big program to somebody mm -hmm. um, while not seeing the results that they would like to see. Um, uh, and that is just because people might, might follow, uh, two exercises. That's the maximum that they are, uh, on average following. Once you give them three, it starts to decline a bit. They might still, follow <laughs> it, but the compliance will start to decline. And, uh, the typical period at which they would follow, uh, the exercise would be about a week up to two weeks, 
and then it's just the paper gets thrown into a drawer and you forget about it because you might start feeling a bit better already. So you feel like, well, I don't really need to do that. It doesn't make me feel any different. And if you don't get another session with a physiotherapist after uh, two weeks or a week, um, you might just forget about it. And it's like, well, I, I feel fine now, so I don't need to do that anymore. Uh, well, if if you get them to play a game, they will be much more willing to uh, to continue engaging in that and I think VR is a great example. Uh, we have games like Beat Saber that there's been so many mm -hmm. stories about people losing weight and uh, being active during uh, during quarantine time, especially. Um, Nintendo Ring Fit Adventure is also a great example. The UK sold out pretty much all samples when uh, the spring quarantine hit in 2020. Uh, so... Um, People really wanted it and they they realized that, okay, this is a good way for me to be active at home uh, because mm -hmm. YouTube workouts are not for everyone. And uh, having your own personal trainer uh, is not possible for everyone. And like even myself, I may be a physiotherapist, but I find it very boring to follow uh, any kind of program at home. <laughs> uh, so I personally rely very heavily on uh playstation vr uh for my uh for my workouts because it's just more fun um if somebody comes over or if we want to have online competition that's also possible and it's just good fun um but uh it, it just gives one more option for people which uh when we're talking especially about gamers they're already used to that um, stimulation from games they 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 love the mechanics that games offer them so getting someone like that and putting them to follow uh, a paper-based program it, it's not gonna work um, but if you put them to play a game instead that is a lot more familiar to them uh, it's gonna be uh, with a lot better result uh, result yeah for sure and I think um, one of the biggest similarities that I can relate to that is, you know, when it becomes the new year, a lot of people go out and say, oh, I'm going to join the gym. I'm going to get a gym membership. And two weeks later, exactly like you said, or three weeks or even a couple of days, the gym card goes in the bag, the gym card goes in the, in the, in the, um, in the drawer and they don't really, you know, bat another eye towards it. And it's one of the biggest lucrative industries. Um, but, uh, it's definitely one of those interesting things. Um, and as you said, being able to have, you know, accessibility, being, in ha being able to have variety. I think variety and options are some of the biggest key things to ensure longevity, to ensure that people are engaging with it because ultimately people hate to be narrowed down. People hate to only have one choice or two choices. Um, and I think being able to explore more options, um, you know, within, you know, in the next couple of years, I'm sure we'll see more in in innovative ideas come to the VR realm. Um, that'll just give more and more options and uh, you can only see positive results from that. Absolutely. I think that gym uh, example is absolutely spot on. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, the unfortunate part about it is that, and we also saw the same after quarantine where a lot of people were stuck at home. They started getting all kinds of restless feelings. So they thought afterwards, uh, okay, everything is open now. Let's go to the gym. Uh, mm -hmm. What happens is that uh, in similar case to that New Year resolution case, uh, you get super motivated to gym. Uh, you might go three, four days in a row, completely overdo what's your uh, capacity, uh, get some kind of impingement, get some kind of pain, uh, and maybe there wouldn't be appropriate trainer because uh, to go to the gym, you really need somebody to show you how you should do safely uh, the exercises. Uh, there is a bit higher bar for um, uh, like an entry level uh, skill that you need to have. So if you are completely clueless with exercise and maybe you have watched some videos on YouTube, it's not really enough. You need that person next to you to really see how you're doing things. Um, because even if you're yourself looking in the mirror and it looks all right, you always need someone to look from the side because it might be a completely different case. And uh, that 
a higher barrier of entrance because of course personal training costs and um, there is a higher risk of injury um, it might deter some people from uh, going for physical exercise but uh, on the other side if you have a system at home uh, whether it's nintendo playstation xbox whatever uh, because it is a game it's um, it's a lot easier to get into it um, and to get that initial fitness level. And it's, um, it's usually very beginner friendly. Uh, there's usually a very low risk for injury. And uh, after experiencing that, it's, um, uh, it's a lot better for people to really think, uh, okay, I actually feel much better after this. Maybe I should seek something uh, a bit more. So maybe then they look into uh, physical training at a gym or a sports facility or somewhere where a professional will uh, will really uh, train them and, and show them how um, more complex exercises could be done. But for home, for a very simple uh, exercise routine, games are fantastic. Yeah, I think uh, all, to all points, they really tick the boxes. And I think that one of the biggest um, examples is that, you know, people go to the gym and you kind of have two kind of different cases. You have those that are really starting out and those that feel a little bit self-conscious about themselves. Um, and as you said, those are the, the newer beginners are more prone to injury um, because they don't know how to do the exercise correctly. They might have improper form. They might watch just be, you know, trying to do some exercise whilst watching YouTube on their phone and saying, oh, am I doing this? Am I looking in the mirror? Um, and ultimately, that's not really something that is really positively reinforced because obviously, you know, it can lead to injuries. And then I think the other, the flip side of that coin is you have those that come in and they think they know that they're actually doing what they are doing. Um, they think that they know they're doing it right, but ultimately, you know, they're potentially causing more problems than they need to be doing. So I definitely think that, um, yeah, having that, you know, beginner friendly entry level in regards to being able to do it at your home, um, it just allows, you know, everything to go a lot more smoothly in terms of starting new exercise programs and, uh, and helping out in that situation. Yeah, absolutely. And the goal is we want people to be active and we want people to be better, to feel good. And there are many options nowadays to, uh, to achieve that. So um, uh, as you said, people like options and I feel like a lot of people consider, uh, to be fit, uh, basically is bound to, uh, you're going to the gym or you're running, uh, which isn't true. There's all kinds of different ways that you can keep fit, that you can keep healthy and going to the gym is one option. If you enjoy it, go for it. Uh, if you like running, also go for it um if you just uh like walking that's also an option if it's safe for you to do that uh but also all kinds of active games and dancing and martial arts and uh not necessarily sports in the sense of uh like just a typical football basketball volleyball kind of team sports but also you can explore so many other different options um that wouldn't necessarily be considered as typical physical activity options, but um, people would be surprised how many options around them they have. They might have a climbing facility that's just not as well advertised or uh, a boxing place that um, is also very small, but uh, provides very good, uh, good advice in there. So um, our goal in physiotherapy as well is to uh, first, uh, make sure we know what the person likes doing and whether that is uh, based in water, uh, outdoors, indoors, uh, or wherever, uh, we take that into consideration and then apply what we know would work best for, uh, for that person uh, and implement it within that space that they really enjoy being in. Because again, if you like it, then that's... Uh, that's a higher chance that you will stick to it. Yeah, for sure. Definitely just allowing them to really engage with it and be understanding towards it can definitely help its case. Um, so in regards to the future, you know, what are your perspectives? What are you looking to, you know, narrow in? Are you looking to get more into clinic-based uh, physiotherapy? 
Uh, you starting to maybe, you know, think about esports on the side as well. Where does your mindset lie? Uh, that is pretty much it. I would definitely like to uh, to keep having my clients uh, in the uh, rehabilitation field. Uh, I would also be very interested in working with uh, with teams, uh, potentially working together uh, with coaches and ensuring that the players get a uh, very good education on what their bodies do during gaming and how they can uh, really spot those minute uh, initial symptoms and report right away. Um, I think transparency in this case will be key uh, to making sure that people stay healthy. Um, working with uh, coaches in terms of knowing when... Um, or rather where their uh, their line ends and to not overstep into an uh, area that they may not be too familiar with, um, which I hope more coaches would be mindful of because that is why we have such a wide variety of uh, health and performance professionals that we can all work together uh, and ensure that uh, players get the best they possibly can uh, so that would be something I'm really interested in, just uh, really educating teams what uh, what health uh, really means for them and how it can help their uh, performance. Uh, as well as uh, on the side, uh, I would be uh, involved in some uh, research from healthcare point of view, uh, because I think, like I mentioned before, uh, education for healthcare professionals is really missing. Uh, in terms of what esports is, what gaming is, uh, a lot more people are doing it. So uh, there is need to know how to properly address it uh, rather than just uh, dissing it as uh, uh, something that is just bad. Um, that will come through research, having more case studies on esports players, seeing really what um, what problems are common among esports players, whether it's wrists, uh, low back pain, neck pain, uh, muscle atrophy, uh, how we can address it uh, in the best way, uh, working to uh, really set those foundations for um, possibly telehealth uh, examination because a lot of the players will be living in their own uh, homes. So uh, if you're in one location and then you have 10 players around the whole country it's not realistic that you'll be traveling to each and every one of them um and unfortunately a lot of the uh clinical tests are person to person based or face to face so uh trying to adapt those into a virtual consultation or a virtual examination platform uh that would be something i'm really interested in uh, of course, doubling down on all the measurements and making sure that we really understand what gaming does to you and how we can help the best that we can uh, to ensure that there is performance growth. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I think definitely one thing we can take away from that statement is that you're definitely in the right field. Um, yeah, there's, it, the passion really shines through, you know, the enthusiasm, the vision, um, and even your understanding of just the complexity of how everyone's involved, you know, working in the multidisciplinary group, everyone has their own role. We don't have a doctor who is also a strength conditioning coach and also a, uh, a physiotherapist. We don't have one key individual. We have a group and uh, there's a reason for that. And uh, I definitely think I agree with you. You know, we need to really, you know, some people really need to understand that um, there is a boundary to your, you know, uh, your vision and, you know, how well you work within a group. Um, and I really think it's definitely something that's going to be awesome uh, to look forward to in terms of the future and how everything starts to progress. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, you know, just starting to wrap up now, I think uh, we definitely had a, a really awesome chat um, throughout everything. I think we really touched on some awesome pieces, uh, your research and your theses and the understanding of the importance of uh, different risk injuries in terms of esports and also just clinical work as well. Um, and how that can translate into, you know, understanding the properties of ergonomics and um, really understanding those injuries. And then also the measurement systems in regards to, you know, how we can start to track in terms of uh, the future and, you know, really getting an understanding about having those regulated systems in place 
uh, to ensure longevity and stability and consistency and efficiency and effective effectiveness uh, with esports as well. Um, so I really appreciate you coming on to the podcast and uh, having a really big in-depth chat. Uh, I definitely think it's one of the in-depth I've done, but it was an absolute pleasure. Um, for those listening, where can we find you on socials? Are you active on any of your socials? Uh, thank you on my part so much for having me. Uh, I know that this is not the most um, typical topic that uh, people would like to talk about um, as healthcare professionals are not at all common in esports. But um, I think it is important for uh, players and teams to know what we can offer them, uh, the expertise that we have, and how we can uh, work in synchron with all the other uh, existing professionals in esports so far. Um, as far as social media goes, uh, I think LinkedIn would be uh, the, the most active for me. You can find me at Violeta Ivanova there. Um, and also at uh, Discord, which can be disclosed in the comments. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on. And uh, I'm really glad that we uh, we managed to get there in the end, especially with the time differences between uh, Finland and AUS. Uh, but yeah, I really appreciate it. And uh, to everyone who managed to stick around, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you take away a couple of really good points from Violetta today. Um, that can really be applied to yourself or, you know, to a friend or to someone that you can really um, help to assist in a daily life. Yes, thank you so much. No worries. Have a good day.